I am here today to talk about the incredible instability of teacher workforces based on some research that I've done in New York City using data over the last 30 years on millions of student outcomes. So here's the short version. Teachers benefit from stability and community and connection. And so it makes sense that when teachers are moving around and getting reassigned, that that might run counter to those basic goals. And so the questions we're going to ask are, how much does this happen? Is it always a bad thing? And for whom? Here's the slightly longer version. <laughs> School organizations have been shown to really matter for the work lives of teachers. In particular, there's a lot of interest in developing professional learning communities. These are designed to be spaces where teachers can come together as adults and learners from one another. And these organizations are often uh, shaped in grade level or subject teams. This kind of work requires that there's a, a mutual vulnerability that's available for teachers. I can show you my practice and I can admit that I'm struggling. And this, of course, requires a great deal of relational trust. And so it makes sense that if there's high instability in the teacher workforce, the teacher faculty in a school, that this might be affected. Okay, and in fact, there's actually some research that does already show that teacher attrition uh, has a negative impact. But anecdotally, we were hearing a lot about another kind of switching around for which there's not a lot of research, and that's within school switching. So this is the idea that teachers might be switching subject or grade level assignments from year to year. And so when teachers are doing this, of course, they're prepping new content. They're working with a different age level. And if you think that a lot of the work for teachers is happening in subjects or grade level teams, this might really matter. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to use data from New York City to talk about that. Uh, we have data on over 300,000 teachers. Before I move on, I just want you to get a number in your head. What percentage of teachers do you think are new to their assignment each year? That's you know, new to the district, new to the school, uh, new to teaching in general, or new to their subject or grade level. Okay? So have a sense of that in your head. And which of these do you think is most common? So one of our main goals today is just go going to be to document this phenomenon. And here's a little preview of our findings. It turns out that a lot of this instability is happening, and the spoiler alert here is that it's going to turn out to have some negative impacts for kids. So why does this reassignment happen? The truth is we really don't know yet, um, but I think it's important to think about what the possible explanations could be. And so there's some possibilities here. Perhaps teachers are assigning themselves. They know themselves, they have preferences, and they are best suited to the positions that they uh, are choosing, or that principals are doing this in an effective and strategic way. Another possibility is that this is an artifact of the normal chaos that happens in these gigantic uh, teacher workforce systems. And so these are all possible, and you can imagine that these different explanations would lead to different predictions about whether these movements are a good or bad thing. So before I move a little bit further, I just want to be really clear about what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm going to use a little graphic here. So I have these two schools, and I have these teachers, and I want to think about whether they're switching by looking at these schools in the previous year. Okay? So first, let's look at these two teachers. They seem to have been in the exact same position in the exact same school last year, so they're not switching. These two teachers here, it's not clear where they came from. In fact, they are either from the new teacher pool or from the, they're from another district. Here we have teacher five. We don't see where that teacher is necessarily coming from in this school, and it turns out that they're replacing an exiting teacher from the year before. And finally, we have these two teachers that are in the same school, but they've switched places, assignments. And those are the kinds of switches that I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about new to teaching, um, also switching across schools, and also switching within schools. I'm going to use these three color-coded characters to keep track of these for us. I'm going to talk about all of them. So I'm going to generally call all of this switching, and specifically I'm going to be focusing on the blue one, which is this within school churn. 
So here are the questions that we're going to answer today. We're going to talk descriptively about some of this switching, how much it happens. And then the latter three questions are really going to focus on churning in particular. So here are some quick facts about switching in general. Each year, about 42% of teachers are switching positions in New York City uh, in one of these ways. And almost every teacher is going to experience one of these switches during their career. Moreover, most teachers are going to do this well more than once. And so this is a phenomenon that is really affecting the lives of teachers and their students quite a bit. So let's break these switch types down. Okay? So we see this 42% that is making some kind of switch. And it turns out that the vast majority of those, 53% of the switches, are this within school churn that we've been talking about. Okay? And the truth is we really don't know much about those effects. Okay? So that's what we're going to talk about next. That pie chart already speaks to the idea that descriptively, this is the majority of the kinds of reassignments that are happening at these schools, and that's important to know. It's also important to know that this has been incredibly stable over the last 30 years. This hasn't really changed much at all, which is quite interesting. Another thing I wanted to know is, is this amount of churning, is it pretty much even across schools? All schools churn about this much, or does it vary? And it turns out that actually there's quite a bit of variation across schools in the amount of churn that's happening. And so we see a lot of schools that are low down. Only 20, 10, 20% of their teachers are on average churning every year. But there are these other schools where up to 50% of their teachers are churning every single year. And that's interesting. So I hope at this point I've kind of convinced you that this is a big deal. There's a lot of it. And I hope you're interested to know how this affects kids. So we'll switch to that next. <clears throat> The econometrician in me cannot help but tell you a little bit about how we do this. So imagine a given student moving through school and that in this fourth year, the student is assigned to a teacher who has recently churned into their position. And in this particular case, we see this dip in their performance that exists only in that year. And you might think, well, that dip might be due to a lot of different things. It could be a something that's happening at home. And that's right. That's the kind of thing you want to worry about here. But we do this for millions of children. And we see if this pattern persists across all of those kids in a systematic way. We also do this for teachers. We look at their kind of average performance over time and look at the year in which they switch. Okay? And we see if there's a kind of a general aggregate effect on their kids' test scores. So these are two of the 12 ways that we do this. Um, but they all end up telling us basically the same thing. There's a negative impact of being assigned to a churning teacher. Okay? And it's about the third of the size of being assigned to a brand new teacher. Okay? But the thing to know here right, that we already know is that this within school churn happens two to three times more than being assigned to a brand new teacher. And in fact, in this district, Almost 70,000 teacher students every year are assigned to a churning teacher. And so the idea here is that these small effects, they aggregate up. Okay? They affect lots of students. Right? In addition, we might worry that not only are these small negative impacts throughout the system, but that they might, in fact, be landing on students differently. There are two possibilities here. One is the possibility that actually in some places this churning is positive and some it's negative, and that's why different kinds of kids are getting exposed and have different impacts uh, related to churning and switching. And the other possibility is that actually switching is just more negative for certain kinds of kids. And those were our two hypotheses. And what we found is that the data is consistent more with the latter. There really are no schools that seem to be churning for the benefit of teachers and students. It doesn't seem to exist. And in fact, what we find is that historically underserved groups of students are the ones who are most likely to be assigned to churning teachers. This mirrors something that we see in the, in the new teacher literature, that the distribution of brand new teachers is uneven. But the idea that even within the same school, kids of different race and different backgrounds are being uh, assigned in some pattern to these kinds of teachers having this particular experience and therefore uh, experiencing the load of this negative impact is quite interesting. 
So here are our takeaways. About half of teachers are switching in one way or another every year. And the vast majority of these switches are this churning that we were talking about that we really didn't know very much about at all. And our achievement analysis suggests that not only are there small negative impacts that pervade the entire system, right, but that those impacts are felt uh, disproportionately by students who are historically underserved. So what are the implications? What can we do with this? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is we need to work with districts to think about why churning is happening and to what degree in their own, in their own places. And I think it's important to acknowledge now, because we can know, that this has a negative impact for students. And so that needs to be taken into account when we think about these uh, reassignment policies. And so if we find that much of churning is unnecessary, then we might want to think about processes for balancing those costs and benefits and uh, doing that more systematically. And finally, I would like to know if there are places or principals or schools that do manage to do this well, this reallocation of their teacher workforce in a way that is productive and beneficial. So thank you very much for letting me talk to you today about my research. I hope it shows you a little example of how we can use this kind of work to improve working conditions for teachers. Thank you.